you as well. So glad you could make it. Traffic is actually crazy. Don't know why. I thought no one would be on the streets, but like someone said, maybe it's free parking. Who knows? Uh, glad you're here. This is going to be a very special evening. And I'm going to chit chat a little bit about some ideas and then we're going to get to talk and get to introduce our amazing author with us. So before we begin, that's kind of a four letter word, isn't it? Busy. It's you know, how many times, oh, I'm too busy, I'm busy, 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 and we kind of, it's almost like an excuse, or you just kind of feel overwhelmed, there's too much going on, and sometimes I think that describes this time of year, there's so many, you know, holidays bumping into each other, and racing to the end of the year, and oh, we finally get there, and, you know, January starts. So, this is a time sometimes to reflect on how to maybe not be busy, or how to handle the busyness, how to maybe de-stress, and think about, you know, maybe personal challenges. I had a recent challenge just a few weeks ago. Woo! I had to take my uh, my 20th year internal medicine board recertification exam. Oh my goodness! I think Carrie will remember that I almost didn't make it back. Um, really stressful, you know, and just for so many reasons. But um, you know, it, it's one of those positions where you, you have to do it professionally, but you feel like you, you know I'm so much more than. Than multiple choice questions. So that was, I guess, my resentment to going in. But, you know, going through that process, I tried to figure out there were some commonalities, some common threads between that process I was going through and maybe some of your many change journeys, behavior change, and trying to you know, get your goals. And so I, I put a couple of random ideas out. And one thought was um, just getting a buddy. So, I had a study buddy, that's my cat, that's my study buddy. Um, you can have a walking buddy, so uh, Mo's not here, but that's Mo in the picture. And sometimes just that other person, I think I, I, I'm an expert now at peripheral neuropathy, my cat was sleeping at the time, but just having that other warm being with you to nudge you or to remind you can just kind of keep you true to yourself. So think about buddies. Don't neglect personal hygiene. Really important when you're busy and you're stressed and you're just thinking about all these other things. And yeah, I'm not sure what she was, I think she was cleaning her hind paw. I was reading about aspergillosis, which is a fungal infection. I hope you didn't know. And Lord knows what that meant in the toilet there. You know, and remember, you're not alone in this journey. This is, it, it kind of feels like when you're just under the gun that you're the only one doing this. And you just have to step back and other thousands of other doctors, I hope, recertifying and many, many other people trying to do this journey as well, certainly in our program. Uh, this was actually from Muir Woods uh, National Monument near San Francisco, and I actually think we were lost. We've been going climbing for, I don't know, two hours up, and I just couldn't believe the sign, Lost Trail, I just said it all. Uh, my daughter was going, I was like, come back, come back, and this little snail, I mean, a couple blocks away in our neighborhood in Magnolia, kind of wandering, so remember, you're, you're not alone. And then just when you think you're having a really difficult day, you know, this is my ex Kindle. My prior, this is probably one of the original Kindles that died during the time I was studying. And my absolute best way of relaxing is to read some fiction just before I go to bed. And the damn thing broke. And, you know, it's that screenshot, it's not glass broken, it's just like a weird picture. And I thought, oh, you've got to be kidding me. And then I happen to remember, this is a picture from a patient who lives in Fort Townsend. And this was the springtime, a little baby deer. And the mother had deposited the little newborn deer on her doorstep and went away. And so they babysat this little deer who took a nap for about two hours. And mama came back and picked her up and they went off. I thought, that has got to be the cutest thing I've ever seen. Oh, we need those moments. So, and that's, that's going to be a great holiday card, I think. So, Well, getting back to fiction a little bit, I am so excited to have none of them, Jane Ann Krentz here. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of introduction. So, this is from her website. Um, she's been a patient for a number of years. She's a Seattle resident. And you may know her by many different names. These are maybe her top three uh, pen names. And she's had so many books, and I think I'm preaching to the choir here, on the uh, New York Times bestseller list does a lot of different styles and um, uh, contemporary romantic suspense, oh, we all need that, historical romantic suspense, and futuristic paranormal romantic suspense, so different names for different uh, genres. 
So she also, um, I didn't know this, is the editor and contributor to a nonfiction essay collection published by the University of Pennsylvania Press called Dangerous Men and Adventurous Women, Romance Writers on the Appeal of the Romance. Wow, do you want to subscribe to that now? Kind of find out what that's all about. Woo. So uh, she got her BA in history from the uh, University of California, Santa Cruz, her master's degree in library science from San Jose State University of California, and was uh, working for a long time as a librarian, both academic and corporate. And then hopefully we'll hear about how she launched into writing. So uh, we give this a warm welcome as we get set up to do a little interview. Thank you. excited to have you here. Oh, this is this is really a pleasure. Um, and in fact, I must admit, I was very almost daunted when I peeked at your Facebook page and saw that she has 63,000 followers. <laughs> so I was very careful when I advertised this uh, this lecture tonight and, and didn't kind of mark it to the web because I thought, who knows who's going to come. <laughs> so um, Maybe as we kind of share our stories, you can kind of tell me um, as we work together, doctor, patient, and you uh, face a new diagnosis of prediabetes. Um, and in case you don't know, prediabetes is not diabetes, but it's the possibility of future diabetes. Otherwise, it's that little red flag, you know, we better do something. Um, and how did that change your life, or how did that make you focus differently on your health? Well, first of all, I was really ticked off. <laughs> because I thought I'd been doing everything right. <laughs> um, but it was in the family. There was a genetic thing going on, probably. And my first thought was, I, I, need, I need nutritional counseling. But I didn't even have to get that far, because along with the diagnosis came the appointment. You made the appointment for me before I even saw you again. I went through the, uh, to the nutritional counseling. And got a handle on what was what was the the basic science behind it all, you know, the chemistry of what was going wrong, what what had to change. Um, but then we got to the diet part, <laughs> and I did my own research on that because at the time I was testing. I don't think you still do that anymore. With, with the um, do people with prediabetes still it, can do the testing? It, it depends. Some people are motivated and some just don't want to even stab their finger. But yeah. I found it very useful because it gave me immediate feedback you know, on what was working, what I could eat, what I couldn't eat. And it, what, it didn't track what the official um, American Diabetes Association diet looked like at all. It, it, I, I, it did me no good. I'm not saying it won't work. I'm just saying when I couldn't get the numbers I needed using that diet. So then I started doing my own research and online and scrounging around and Dr. Baumgartel gave me permission to do it, to go out and find what worked for me. She didn't make me stick with a certain diet, she didn't tell me I had to start with meds or anything else, she just she gave me three months and... That's not that long, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but three months to find my way and I used the testing to do it and everything. And I came up with my own little pyramid, you know the, you know the FDA has that, that the FDA yeah. does that food pyramid, and the first trick I learned right off the bat was, I better stop thinking about all the things I can't have, yeah. <laughs> and I better start thinking about all the things I can have, and that was the big mindset change, I think that's the basic mindset change, and then creating my own pyramid of stuff that worked for me on my diet, and um, that that has sustained me for 10 years. It's been, it's been I'm yeah, 10 years. Yeah. Like going on 11 years. And I'm perfectly happy with the diet. My husband, bless him, moved right over on it with me. Um, says he lost 40 pounds the first year. <laughs> um, because it, in all in all, once you get a list of everything you can have and the foods you can enjoy, and you start looking at it from that point of view, it becomes much easier, I found, to, to stick to a diet. And I, turned out to be an all-or-nothing sort of personality, which I kind of suspected about myself going in. I had been known to go through an entire bag of potato chips, you know. Um, all, all of it. All, not, whole, not, not yet, but all yeah, of it. The whole bag, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll buy the large side lays by. Um, and what I found is I had to, ex for me, I had to just exclude whole categories of food, like no more potatoes, period. Not, not, 
not the little three bites of potatoes that you could have and be, be, be okay, because that just whetted my taste buds for potatoes that I couldn't have as many as I wanted. So I found that for me it worked to um, just exclude categories of food. No potatoes, no pasta. I just don't go there. And then I don't get the craving going. So that's and I think that's what that's what I was really and I still am very impressed by because you you looked in and you decided, you know, what's your style, what what resonates with you, what makes you tick, instead of just like, oh here, try this. And I think for someone else, you know, to exclude whole groups of whatever would be actually um, very dif difficult. And and, and, that and, it's, and it's not the best way to go. It's just the way it worked for me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's yeah. yeah. That's, so it's it's finding out something about your own personality that yeah, as you started to make these changes and, and, on, and ongoing over time, did you on purpose or accidentally in, engage family or friends, or, or did you feel defensive, or like you didn't want to talk about it, or you wanted them to support you? How did, what was that dynamic like? Um, well, I got immediate support from my husband, which was great. My brother had actually been diagnosed and was full-blown diabetic several years earlier, and he had, he just could not do the diet thing preferred to go the medicine route. So there wasn't much support there because he'd, got, he'd taken a different path into the disease than I wanted to take. And that, that was, so, um, and family mostly just didn't quite understand it, I think. Uh, the exception of my husband just went with it. He was very supportive. Um, I think my mom, did, my mom felt guilty. <laughs> like she'd done something wrong, you know, give me something wrong. Um, but it also gave me a chance to find out a little more about family history, where it come from, because then it comes out that my grandfather did indeed get told he, I guess in those days they called it a touch of sugar. Yeah. Yeah. Different label. Yeah. And even, and I, and I don't know what they had for medication, but they knew you should lay off the sugar. They knew that much going in. And mom said he couldn't. We were talking about everybody. He, on it. Yeah. he yeah. just had that piece of pie with scoops of sugar on it. At, on for dessert every night. Oh. He just, so, so he was not able to even do what the, the minimal amount at the time. So. Yeah. yeah, how um, along the way, I'm sure you've had some little pitfalls or you know, detours into the ditch, but um, how do you get back on target? Uh, how were you able to um, socialize with friends or other people and, and not feel like you're going to blow it in terms of the goals you set yourself with your nutrition? I only ran into one. <laughs> It's basically a low-carb diet, I mean that, and that's actually a fairly fluid diet. I can go into any restaurant. I'm not, yeah, yeah, I'm not locked out in a restaurant, and I'm not locked out going over to somebody's house. There's going to be a salad, there's going to be a vegetable, there's going to be meat or fish, you know. I'm, so I'm, it really hasn't been that much of a social problem. Um, <laughs> but there was one awkward moment one afternoon when um, I, was a, I was on a book tour, and some people had really, they were really excited, they wanted to treat me to something special, and they had booked a full-blown high tea at a local oh, fancy. Oh. <laughs> Four tiers of it. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, it was awful. And I didn't want to be, I mean, it was only one meal, I thought, this is not going to kill you, you know, just a little bit here, a little bit there, and look like you're enjoying yourself, you know. That was the only time that was I ever kind of had that deer in the headlights feeling. It's like, oh my God, what do I do with this? There's nothing on that tray. <laughs> so for you, you felt like there were almost nice choices that you could enjoy where yeah. you were. That was the yeah. only time, seriously, the yeah. only time. Yeah. Most of the time, you're going to be in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. And that's easy. Yeah. I never had any problem with that. Did you feel like you were restricting yourself a lot? or? I did at first. Mm -hmm. um, I really, really missed potatoes. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. They were my... I could eat potatoes six ways from Sunday all week long. Um, the pasta was the easiest to give up. Oddly enough, I don't know why, because I really love pasta, but when you get right down to it, um, that was the easy one to give up. The potatoes were the hard one. You don't realize how many, how often you reach for potatoes. <laughs> you put them in a stew, you, you bake them, you, 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 know, you serve them on the side, you can do so many things with potatoes. But I can swear by the benefits of rutabagas. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just going to say, I bet Carrie knows a lot of techniques to have substitutes that are just as yummy and maybe even yummier and not a potato. <laughs> and, and the, you know, the, one of the hardest things was actually getting over my fear of fat. I had been raised in the era when all fat was bad. All fat was bad. Yeah. Um, and if you did have fat, you'd have a little olive oil, but that was it, man. That was no, nowhere else. And 
with a low carb diet, you, you could stop worrying about that. You probably should gulp down the butter and the. Yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned that. I think you know it's been decades, and we're still you know, walking any grocery aisle. Maybe you shouldn't be in the aisle, you know. And and it's almost subliminal. You're going to reach for the one that says low fat, and why that's built into us for so many years is it's a shame. There's so many good healthy fats and oils we need for our system, for our metabolism. You know? And and I think any diet that you're going to survive on for a decade or more has to have some reward. If it, if you try to de deprive yourself of everything that's good to eat, mm -hmm. I. Nobody can live like that. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm assuming, as a writer, you sit a lot. And um, how do you kind of work in exercise and activity when you have a, a sit-down job, so to speak? Yeah, it's. Um, I, you have to book it in. You have to just put it into this, onto the schedule every day, every single day. We also made the decision to live downtown several years ago, and the benefit of that is we no longer use the car. So even for minor stuff, I'm going to have to walk. I'm going to have to go to the market. I'm going to have to go to the Safeway or something. I'm going to be walking. So I have to go to Nordstrom. I have to walk. Yeah, it's, it's become that little <laughs> light at the end of the tunnel. Just keep going. There's a Nordstrom. So, yeah. um, so but, but other than that, I do five days a week. I book in three days a week. Are weight training and two days a week are Pilates. And the rest of it's just walking around town kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. if, it, if it's a bad day and we're indoors all day or something, I'll get on the treadmill for half, you know, an hour or mm -hmm. half an hour or so. But usually there's something to take you outside. And, I, and you're obviously, as a writer, you have a lot of discipline, and that's probably your forte. I think that's a key point for many folks who just are tired, days long of work, da, 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 and they just, you know, oh, well, I'll work out tomorrow. Yeah. When to you, that's imperative. That is part of your day. And I, I really like that. Yeah, I think I think you have to treat it as seriously as mm -hmm. as, a, as a any kind of appointment. Yeah. Yeah. Did you do a lot of journaling? Did you do uh, tracking? Uh, maybe early on, but is that something that that resonated over time, or did it fall off? The only thing I was tracking was food. <laughs> <laughs> but more to what did um, yeah. recipes? Uh -huh. I'm building up my own recipe collection from scratch because all the recipes I had left over from the other life. Um, have potatoes in them. <laughs> <laughs> I have a great recipe for shortbread cookies I will never make again. You know, I mean, those were the kind of recipes you collect. Sure. Um, but so I started, fortunately, we live in an age when there's a lot of stuff online. If you go looking for low-carb recipes online, you know, there's mm -hmm. tons of them out there. And a lot of people have found um, workarounds and fixes and substitutes. and. Um, and I can testify to the wonders of the spiralizer if you don't have a spiralizer. Prepare <laughs> this pump there. So tell us all what a spiralizer is. Uh, spiralizer. I don't know who invented this. Somebody <laughs> said it's actually a mandolin yeah. uh, in a different, you know, in a different way. All I know is you can put a zucchini through it and you get out the other end something that looks, and I swear to God, tastes like pasta. Just as good. It's really amazing. Yeah. So it has a different texture. And it's got it a different bulk as it goes through. Well, it's you're just going to warm it up with the sauce, whatever sauce you're using. So you're going to still have the al dente thing going on. Rutabagas work well. Uh, zucchini works well. Uh, turnips. There, there's. You have to be careful with the root vegetables because you need to get into the starchy root vegetables, but some are not, and that's that's what you're looking. Zucchini is the easiest to work with, and it gives you the most pasta-like um, output. Yeah, yeah. I need kohlrabi might work. I've done kohlrabi. Yeah. Yeah. Broccoli yeah. stems are really broccoli good. stems. Yeah, and you can use it. I use them a lot. I use those things in salads. Mm -hmm. I just chop them up. And yeah, it come, the blades are very sharp. <laughs> <laughs> like a handle? Be careful. <laughs> well, um, we can certainly come back to some of these interesting topics, but I'm dying to ask you a bit about your writing career and about your books, and I'm sure people are eagle. And you can chip in toward the end. I had a couple of questions to maybe start you off, and I'm sure you've been asked these many times before. But I'm always interested, and people always ask, well, how did you become a doctor? What, what made you interested in being a doctor? What, how did you come into being a writer? What, you started. I started writing, I had always read a lot of fiction, right? I, I mean, 
huge Nancy Drew fan when I was a young kid. I read, you know, a lot of Robert Heinlein's college and Andre Norton and um, all the way through high school. And then I went out into the real work world, and there was, for the first time ever, I actually ran it as a librarian, ran into what we think of as romance novels. It wasn't, they were not that readily available to me as a child or as a teenager. I kept them out of the library, probably. <laughs> <laughs> or turn the other direction, send her over to Wuthering Heights if she wants romance, you know, <laughs> sad ending. Um, so I sort of stumbled into it, and there was this whole genre that I just had never explored before. And there comes a point, I think, if you're going to become a writer, it's not that you're telling yourself, I could write this better than the author has written this book. What you tell yourself is, I want to end it my way. I want the story to go my way. And if that happens, you start writing. But if you don't have that impulse, you, you probably just won't ever start. I, and everybody I know who writes genre fiction mystery, suspense, they read a lot of it and just loved the genre first. And I had also read a lot of suspense, which is right, why I, I always write a, a mix of romance and suspense. Um, and I think that you just get to the point where you want the story in your head instead of the story that you're reading. And that's when you start writing. And if that doesn't happen, you don't. And um, what inspires your stories? Do you start just de novo, or do you have ideas that ruminate for a while, or how does, how does is it just different each book they happen? Yeah, I think that I get asked this question a lot, and I don't have a really good stock answer. It's basically the where did you get your idea? Yeah. But the closest I've come to being able to explain it to people that they that they get it right away is to think of whatever it is in your life that you're passionate about, whether it's cooking or sewing or knitting, or um, painting, or work with it perhaps. Um, whatever your personal passion is, you don't have to think of ideas. You don't have to sit down and think of, how am I going to how am I gonna have an idea to make this, this dress, or, or, or cook this food. You just start doing it. You just start, you, you kind of have a sense of how the flavors will taste, or how the dress will look, and you go with that. And it's, it's all about, um, it's all about understanding that everybody has a passion. I think a lot of us spend a lot of our lives looking for it, you know, trying to find it. I didn't really find mine until I was probably, you know, 25 or 30 that before I realized that writing was going to be for me. Um, but I was always out there. I was always kind of looking for something, you know, something. I, was, I tried painting. I tried cooking. I tried sewing. I was lousy at all three. <laughs> um, but I was obviously looking for something, and, and then I kind of fell in. So the ideas come because I can't stop them. They're just, they're, they're coming from within. It's not like you're following I remember straight. sitting in second grade, I swear to gosh, and writing myself into a Superman story, you know, in second grade. I can remember sitting there doing that, and just totally zoning out on whatever second graders are doing. Um, and, and that storytelling is just always there. Do you have a favorite character or favorite genre or favorite book even? Of oh, mine? Yeah. Um, it's always the one I'm working on now. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Once I write a book, it's done. But don't forget, by the time you see that book, I've been through it a yeah, million times. It's a while. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sick of that book. <laughs> it's definitely done. Yeah. Now, can you give us a, a, a sneak comment or a concept about the book coming up uh, in December? Secret, Secret Sisters. Sisters. Secret Sisters. Um, this is actually kind of a new adventure for me. Those of you who read me will recognize me. It's not like I've gone off the deep end of my writing or anything like this. But I, somewhere along the line with this book, I found a broader landscape, more relationships, more, um, more intense suspense. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like it's where I've been headed for a while. I'm speaking to her because I know she reads me so she can get what I yeah. you should be able to say. And in the past two or three books, you may have seen it coming along with Trust No One. And, yeah, so it's it's not like a radical departure, but I feel like I've been headed in this direction for a while, and now I'm there. And it's like, this is where I was meant to be, at least for now, for, with the writing. And I think for those of you who have read me, it will just, it'll seem, it, it, it's all my voice, it's always my voice, and my, my kinds of characters, because I can't, 
do other kinds because I don't care about other kinds. I only care about the kind I do. Otherwise, I do other kinds, right? <laughs> um, and I think that it's just a, a little broader fictional landscape, more points of view, more things going on around it. So, but that's as, as well as I can describe it. It's uh, Secret Sisters is a Pacific Northwest setting. I used the San Juan, invented my old San Juan Island, <laughs> which, which writers do around here a lot. There's a lot of islands yeah. in San Juan. You never, <laughs> you never heard there are 100 islands down there. <laughs> <laughs> Got another one here, Cooper Island. Um, and I really like the Northwest settings. I do it with what is frequently just because we've got so much atmosphere to work with here. So it's all right. Now, do you have a typical, there's probably a typical day for me, but do you have a typical work day or where you do? Is it in your house or do you have a special place or special, is it computer, is it pen and paper? What's your, what's your, uh, I work best when I'm in my office. Uh -huh. um, I can work outside the office. I can doodle ideas, I guess you would think, and if, you know, if I'm sitting on a lounge chair or something by the pool or something like that, <laughs> if I had a pool. Um, but when I'm actually working, I like the, I, I can't say it's the formality of the office because it's a raving mess most of the time, but it is my office, it's my space, and I, I just work best there, it seems to. Most of the writers I know are pretty disciplined. I don't know anybody who just waits for inspiration and and then gets published. <laughs> it doesn't happen very often. Do you right. ever, not that maybe it's too passe a term, but do you ever get writer's block? No, okay. it's not a really good, it, it's, yeah. yeah, I don't quite know what writer's block is. Um, it doesn't mean everything you write is great or everything you want to finish. There's certainly been times all in every book where, where I hit down a, a dead end road and I got to back out and start and mm -hmm. I realize this is not where I want to be. Um, the easy, the, there are tricks for, when you feel stymied, mean, there's tricks for thinking about it from a different point of view. One of the easiest for a fiction writer is to simply go into the head of one of the other characters. Say, you, say you've written a scene in the heroine's point of view and you just don't know where to go with it. Uh, try coming at it from the villain's point of view or try coming at it from the um, hero's point of view or some other side character. And all of a sudden that opens up a whole new avenue for, for writing. So that's how I, yeah. I get out of it. Um, and, um, you know, I don't know how many books you've published, but there are quite a few, right? Yeah. How many books have you uh, published? Over 100 now. I oh, stopped counting. I don't wow. count anymore. <laughs> and you've, uh, you've been on the New York Times bestseller list a number of times. Yeah, right? over 50 times. Oh my gosh. Is this something that is um, kind of like an award, or is there like a certain uh, prestige, you have, do, they, do they call you up, hey, you made it, or how, how do you Yeah, the lists that? are important, and at, even after all these years, the New York Times is still the, the most important list. I don't think it's the most accurate list, but it has the cachet. It's the one people recognize, you can say it to anybody, even if they don't read, they know what it means. So it's, it's never lost its cachet. I think actually in terms of really counting which, how, the best-selling books in the country at any given time, the best list is the USA Today list, which comes out on Thursdays in the USA Today newspaper. But nobody cites that, nobody references it. it and yet they're actually using hard numbers, um, hard covers, paperbacks, ebooks, everything, all counted on one list. So it's really a clear uh, snapshot of what's selling. But, uh, but the New York Times still has that. Now, uh, in terms of method, uh, your books come out in hardcover, but right, is there a certain uh, format for also having them come out at the same time uh, electronically, like ebooks, or is that something that's yeah. done differently depending on the book? Ebooks really through New York. I see. I, when I say New York, I'm referring to the, like the core, the old school publishing industry as a mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. um, you have to understand that Seattle's a long ways away from New York. <laughs> and I don't think, I know because I talked to them, they just never saw Amazon Kindle coming. They just uh, got run over like a truck. I <laughs> wow. um, to this day. <laughs> it, it really, it, it just didn't think anything could be that successful in that book world if it didn't come from New York. Um, I love my editor dearly. I, I, they've done great for me and I'm very grateful to be with them. But they really have a kind of my own of how the book world works, and they call the shots. But um, 
this, the whole ebook revolution just thoroughly changed everything. Among other things, it, it meant that although there still are gatekeepers, and we gatekeepers are with agents and editors, you know, you have to get through an editor, you have to get through an, an agent before you can sell a book. Um, but now the self publishing phenomenon has created several bestsellers, to totally outside New York. For example, this uh, movie, The Martian, okay, which is everybody mm -hmm. loves, I can't wait. Um, that book was originally self-published. New York didn't want it because it had too much science in it. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> then they picked it up. Now, now if you want to go to uh, Barnes & Noble now, you'll see uh, copies of The Martian. They will be published by New York. They ran, when they realized what they'd done, what, how popular this book was, they, they raced out and made the, an, off, an offer. <laughs> The author couldn't refuse, but um, so even though it's not going to happen a lot because it's really really hard to get into bookstores unless you come from New York, unless your book is published in New York. But you can make a splash online and start building an audience with self-publishing, and that is a whole new ballgame that never was possible before. Now, um, for your book coming out next month, are you having a book signing or an event for that? Yeah, I will have, I'll be doing a signing at Page Two Books in Burien. Anybody know Burien? Yes. Good. Um, <laughs> Tracy's going to be. Yeah. <laughs> Page Two Books, they have a great little bookstore there. Yes, they do. Yeah. 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 Um, and third place at Lake Forest Park, third place books. So, they're great. Yeah, it's going to be the first, well, it's the 8th and 9th. First signing is the 8th. Second signing is the night. So. Just in time for the holidays. Yes. Sure. Great stocking stuffer, yeah. sign book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just like to open it up to anyone who wants to ask any questions. I don't want to dominate. So please chip in and, and this is a free for Yeah. I just want to know when you had your medical diagnosis, did it in any way make its way into your writing? Good question. Um, you'll notice <laughs> my characters. Usually, at some point in the book, eat, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you will notice so. you will notice that the recipes have changed. <laughs> no. Now we can mention it. Yeah. I I always I was all we were always primarily vegetarian, even before all this happened. So the only meat that ever showed up in my book, it, what the only thing we ate was fish. We eat fish, but we didn't eat red meat. So. It used to be that I would just have the bad guys eating the steak, right? Cut <laughs> <laughs> them off one way or the other. Oh, my husband's going to eat them. But now, but now the, the potatoes are gone too. <laughs> so, so yes, it, it has made my way. Um, but I haven't actually had a character have to, have to deal with the issues yet. It would probably be a good idea to do it just because it's getting to be such a common diagnosis. I can't tell you how many people in my life in the past five years have said, guess what? We got the warning. I think they're catching it earlier. Doctors are right. catching it earlier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's a bit daunting, I think. You yeah. know, when they, uh, very recently, in this past year, they changed the uh, guidelines or the, the cutoff for the blood testing. It's something called the A1C or hemoglobin A1C. Um, and it used to be, you know, six and above is that pre-diabetes and 6.5 and higher is diabetic. Well, then they kind of jammed it down. You have to be below 5.7. This happened in the past year. Of course, half of my patients got really mad at me because, like, well, last year I was 5.8, you said I was fine, and now what's going on? And so a little tiny part of me almost resented that. I thought, oh, for God's sake, which drug company is behind this? And I thought, no, <laughs> let's get off your high horse here. There's a reason. And, and I think there's value in saying, hey, that little red flag, you know, what we do now can really prevent this from turning into, you know what, diabetes. So I think there's value, not to panic, but to, you know, that's why I really admire what you've and, done. And I had changes. seen it in my own family, so I didn't want to go down that road if I could avoid it. And I figured at the worst case scenario, I could at least postpone the inevitable at some point. I don't know if I'll be able to keep it under control forever, but at least I've pushed it off into the the far future. And, and you probably are tired of me praising you all <laughs> the time. I do, for year after year after year. I needed that because, because I, I was alone out there. In person or in writing and now with my chart, electronic portal to your record. You're like, way to go, what a star, you're doing fabulous. And I think that that's, you, you are um, 
you know, here's the bell curve, you're over here. You know, the average person doesn't, unfortunately, take that to heart the same way you did. And look at themselves, 11 years later, it's like it's, it's never really even happened. Yeah. And I just really commend you for that. Well, I, I, I just needed that support. And I, interestingly, I've had friends who have got the same situation where they, they didn't see it coming. They thought they were doing all the right things, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden they get this pre-diabetes diagnosis. And their doctors did not do that kind of support. And I was shocked. And the only reason they knew there was an alternative was because I said, well, my doctor is in They They just, they are getting, people are getting the support they need out there. You, you've been my cheerleader from, from day one. She's, She's easy to cheer. <laughs> yeah, when I came out of the nutritional counseling, though, I was traumatized because she, the nutritionist had said, tell your doctor she needs to talk meds. And, and be, I mean, before I even had a shot at trying, and, and you said no. Three, you got three months. <laughs> Shave up or ship out. Well, and, and I think, fortunately, that was 11 years ago. And I think we've all learned from that approach, too. And, and, you do you know, think? But I've got that. friends who are not getting that advice. So oh, I feel bad. You just come on over here. <laughs> <laughs> It makes all the difference to have that support, especially because I was out there alone. I couldn't find anybody else doing it through exercise and food. So, thank you for that. I think I feel like you gave me a decade without a diagnosis that could have come. Yeah. So, well, you look fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> so do you. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Totally off subject, but. Um, I really need a desk bunny. I'm <laughs> just wondering if there's ever any thought of possibly some sort of merchandising. Oh, God. Um, Those dust bunnies have taken over my Jane Castle life. So now, you have to educate me. I'm not sure I understand. Yeah. You wanted a dust bunny. So the tell future. me the story now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The future. Obviously, I'm yeah, ready. <laughs> under the name Jane Castle, I write a futuristic uh, setting with, uh, mm -hmm. on a planet called Harmony. And these are basically. Um, it, it's a, it's a, I took colonists, I, I, I well, let's try this again. Okay, so the planet had was cut off after it was, shortly after it was colonized. It was cut off from Earth and it's been on its own ever since. So it's gone its own way. But it basically looks a lot like Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> With different flora and fauna. And I needed an animal. You know how you, often see dogs in books or characters in books who have cats or a horse. You know, there's, animals are very, very useful in fiction because they show so much about the personality of the character. So I came up with this little fluffy thing that has got six, six paws and, and looks like a ball of dryer lint, you know, <laughs> except, except when it's upset and, or going hunting, in which case it has four eyes and a lot of teeth. And, <laughs> The, the, the saying is, by the time you see the teeth, it's too late. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so these little dust bunnies have became like, I don't know, just characters for my heroines to have or a hero to have a dust bunny pal, you know, in, like a dog or a cat. And now, that's all readers care about, the damn dust bunnies. That they don't you care. started a cult. I love it. I love it. <laughs> You know, I never hear about the cleverness of the plot, or, <laughs> or that was really interesting what you did with the old alien relics and stuff like that. Nothing was just, oh, I love that best buddy, I love that best buddy. Well, it's like a, mar a good marriage is like that. Uh, so they love your book. Like, yeah, they want that. Yes, they'll never sweep your floor again. Yes. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, what authors do you read from a good favorite one. stories? Of Who do I read? What was it? Who, what authors do I read? Um, there's a really good series going right now by my friend uh, Christina Dodd. The first book in the series is called Virtue Falls, and the second book is called Obsession Falls. And this is set in a small town on the coast, uh, um, Washington coast of North. And really good suspense. It's a really good, if, if you like suspense with your, your romance, and if you like Continuing characters and ongoing, you know, ongoing characters in the town that you get to know. Um, so I can really recommend Christina Dodd. I also like Elizabeth Lowell. She does really well-researched uh, suspense. Um, Susan Elizabeth Phillips, who writes 
more like women's fiction, I guess you would say. There's always a relationship, there's always a romance in it, but um, the, real, the issues in the books tend to be more um, typical of what we think of as straight women's fiction type stories. And I like John Sanford, who writes suspense. Um, I loved Robert B. Parker, who was a mystery writer who died. Not that you're going to know it, because he's still publishing. <laughs> Under his name lives on. <laughs> well, the estate hired a. <laughs> it, it, it's Tom Clancy the same way. Um, the estate's hired a, these really really popular author. I don't. I haven't seen it done with women writers too much, but lately I've seen more and more dead male authors <laughs> continue to have a flourishing <laughs> career. <laughs> and the estate wow. still we may change that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so. Um, yeah, and I, like I said, I really enjoyed this book, The Martian. Never expected to. That was a, if you haven't tried it, it's really interesting. It's just a, it's a great voice. So I could go on, but because I do read a lot. Could you comment? As a reader, I read a lot, and I like to reread, which I know some people don't. But if I like the book the first time, I'm probably going to like it even better the second and the third. So I tend to buy and keep and. So many authors now are coming out in hardcover first, and I have a choice of buying a hardcover that's harder to store yeah. and more expensive to buy, or wait for it to come out in the paperback. And then, of course, there are the trade paperbacks, which are sort of a compromise. Yeah. But do you, what do you see in publishing with actual books? Because I don't do the ebook thing. Is this just going to be a continuing trend? Well, well, those three formats, what you described, the hardcover, the trade size, that's what they yeah, call that odd, oversized, bit, and then the mass market paperback, those are the three traditional right. sizes. And those have always been with us. And it was pretty routine that the best-selling authors would come out in hardcover. A year later, the book would roll over, as they call it, into paperback. The paperbacks now come out sooner. You'll oh. notice you, you rarely wait a full year now. It's usually going to be more like eight or nine months before the paperback comes out. So they shortened that time frame. Uh, and now we have the ebook, which is the other yeah. option. Um, I don't see much changing in that tradition simply because there's not a lot of alternatives. I mean, those are, those are the options. There is a market that only wants hardcover because they like the larger print. They like the oh, feel of a, you know, there's a, just a, a feel to a hardcover book. Other people crave the paperback um, because it fits into a purse or a pocket. Uh, but for many people, the print's too small. Oh, the paper's not very expensive. Um, so there's a market for each format that you're talking about. Interestingly, in the UK, they all come out at once. All three. Really? All three huh. formats? Really? Mm -hmm. wow. And that has been their business model for, wow. for decades. Wow. But here in the US, it's been wait for the rollover. Yeah. And that I don't see changing. Okay. I have raised the issue myself, but it's a good question. I was just curious. I said, why don't you bring out the paperback the same time you do the hardcover? Um, oh, and it would hurt hardcover. That's yes. exactly yeah. what they say. <laughs> that's exactly what they say. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I think about my own reading style, a little different than yours, and I think I was almost hoisted upon me. I was the kind of person that had to have at least three books ready to go when I was finished whatever I was reading, because I'd be nervous that there was another book to start. It's like, oh my gosh, that's almost a hyperventilating. And uh, because of arthritis in my hands, I don't like hardcover because yeah, it's, too, heavy. it's yeah. too heavy and yeah. clunky and it hurts, so it's awkward. Well, my darling husband got me a Kindle. That was the one you saw that was broken yeah. a number of years ago. And um, the first three days, I detested it. I thought, this is not reading. I, I, I <laughs> want to turn a page and like, what is this? And I, I thought, oh my god, you spent money on this? And then literally three days, it's like the, the, the device melted away and I was in the store and I thought, I'll be darned. And, and so, I, I, you know, I have books, but I actually, and for those of us who may have some arthritic challenges, it was a dream. So I could load up 50 books and they're all there waiting for me. And it was just, it was such a pleasure. So it didn't take that long to kind of tr cross that line. I didn't think I could do it though. I fully but, expected that to do away with the large print edition. You know how you go yeah. to a library you see large print for the visually impaired? Because on the Kindle and on the ebook you can actually change it. Yeah. And I thought that would do in large print, but it hasn't, oddly enough. Yeah. So there's that. Some people still like a real book. Yeah. 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 A books, a books, a books. But you know, you can't, with the electronic ones, you can't trade them and share them no. as widely as you can with yeah. physical. Yeah. 
Yeah. But I'm glad you're still doing this. And one thing I just still miss is like, oh, 50 pages, that's what they're talking about. I'm like, I don't know what number I was at. And I just, yeah. electronically, I can't turn back to that page yeah. of what I want to go to. So it, it's, it's not the same. No, but, it's uh, not the same, but it's a pretty alternative. It's <laughs> a different experience. And, this, and the generation coming up now will probably be so familiar with it. They, they'll just move from one through. Although, interestingly enough, if you think about it, um, like all the Harry Potters, the Twilights, all the books that we think are aimed at that younger generation, they were all huge bestsellers in hardcover. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm curious, um, Faith, uh, maybe address a little bit more, but when you got your diagnosis that set you off, that pissed me off. <laughs> was, was that the driving force? That, being, being pissed off? Yeah. That, that, I mean, I just, I, my personal experience is, oh, um, I have to, you know, I'm just going to continue on my way and wait for it, which is basically what I did, and started waiting for people around me to start dying before I oh. included. But I just wondered what, what it, to me it's impressive that you, you didn't just wait for it to happen. Well, I think part of what I had going for me going in was that I had always been interested in nutrition. And this is like the one disease I know of where you can actually affect it with mm -hmm. what you eat. And that's not true of many diseases. So if I had to get anything, like I told you early <laughs> on, I said, you know, this was the one. Because it's something that allows you to be proactive. And and if you I've always been a sort of person, again, my personality type was such that if there's something I can do to change a situation, I'm going to go do it. That, you know, that's just the way I go through life. I'm proactive in things that I can be proactive in, and this offered me that opportunity. And it fit into an, a long-standing interest, the nutrition. I just had, I'd like, I've been a vegetarian since college, you know, so I'm, and my mother was actually a home ec major at UW. Back when home ec was a real science, yeah. I might add. I mean, we're talking chemistry, and mm -hmm. it was a very serious science. Um, so there was that in my background that gave me a kind of a push in that direction. When I, when I, the first brick wall I ran into was when I realized that the diets that were online that were approved by the American Diabetic Association or the Jocelyn. Jocelyn? Mm -hmm. The Harvard Jocelyn. Yeah. Jocelyn Diabetes Center. Yeah. 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 We're not going to work for you. And here's your clue, right? You subscribe to the you subscribe to the American Diabetic Association magazine, and on the cover every month is a piece of pie. <laughs> yes. 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 This oh, probably was Splenda. <laughs> exactly. It may be the Splenda version, but I'm telling you, it's a piece of pie, and that's the, just not what you want to see on the cover of a magazine that you're trying to read like the bait and switch. I can see, I know where you're getting at, though, Teresa, that question, because it, it struck me, again, over all these years knowing you, um, it, that that's something inside you that was just so profound and strong. I, mean, I have so many patients who don't come, kind of follow the signals, and one in particular I can think of, a man who had a four-vessel heart bypass, almost died, and still didn't get the need to lose 100 pounds. I mean, what makes us individually kind of get it, and what, does, what makes us resonate, like, this is so important. I actually praise you. I think you've done a fantastic job in your journey. I mean, really. I thought so till I hear. <laughs> <laughs> I am not climbing up the stairwell. Now she, you can make it. Yeah. But yeah, because I mean, you know, I just I think back and I said, well, I just sat and waited for it to happen. But you're not sitting any longer. Here no. you are. You're on the program. Yeah. yeah. I think Mo, Mo wants to wait. Okay. Little. So I guess following from Teresa's question. If this was 11 years ago, um, I mean, I'm finding I look at the grocery store differently now, but the grocery store has changed a lot. Yeah. If I think about it in the last five years, yeah. do you feel like there's a larger shift that you already knew things, you're kind of ahead of the crowd, but that you watch other shifts take place and you go, yeah, this is going to be good for the people coming behind me? Or? Well, I think just thinking about, for example, the gluten-free craze, which is so big right now. I think if it just gets people thinking about what they eat, it's worth everything right there, you know, even if they don't 
go gluten free, and I, I'm, you know, not advocating one way or the other, but it's getting people to think about the food they're putting in their mouth. That, for example, one of the basic things you learned, and, and I did get this from the nutrition counselor. She wasn't all wrong, but I, she wasn't all bad. Um, but my friends who got just just got this pre-diagnosis, pre, pre, uh, pre diagnosis were not told. They never learned how to read the label. You know how on the back of a peanut butter jar there will be a, it'll say like six grams for two tablespoons, and then there's the fiber, and you get to subtract the fiber from the <laughs> from the gram from the fat, you know, uh, for the carbs and just basic label reading, people who you think would know better, they, they don't read labels. I'm just appalled at how many people don't read labels. I don't know what to make of that. And I think part of it is because I had always done my own cooking at home and I didn't use a lot of processed foods. Um, so I was always in the habit of kind of, when I did use something in a can, I, I, knew, I wanted to know what was in the can kind of thing. So that was another thing I had going on. But that's a skill anybody can learn. You just have to start thinking in terms of yeah. not what's on the front of the can, but what's yeah. on the back of the can. I think when people start to do it, it's almost like a chore. But then you get natural, it gets easy, and it's just something yeah. you do without even thinking. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah that's just kind of start somewhere. It's a skill set you just pick up real fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to uh, keep this open for questions, um, and those who must uh, depart uh, for personal reasons or traffic, um, I want to pass this around. Uh, with a pen. And um, believe it or not, those of you who are in the Menu for Change program, if you would like a book coming up in December, the book is coming up, I'm going to buy one for you and have oh, Jane so autograph it. I will so be I'm going to pass this around and please pick your name. I will be very, so thank you. I will be very pleased. Don't go and, don't go and pre order on Amazon. Wait for your copy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I just want to say it's just been um, a pleasure having you. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's fun to just kind of hear your perspective. I mean, well, we're all coming at our journey from a different angle. And uh, I can just say with all Akalaz, she is just doing fantastic. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. And, and I just see it continuing forever. <laughs> <laughs> like you're writing, even after you're dead. So I'm writing for you. Even after I'm dead, so I'm going to be watching my carbs. <laughs> so, uh, Thank you so much. Look, she's not going to take it. Thank you very much.